Well, first I'd like to, uh, like everybody else, thank the organizing committee and uh, Ashley, or she's not there, patience with me uh, in providing my presentation. Uh, I just came back last night from uh, almost two weeks out in the sunbathing and scuba diving in the Caribbean. <laughs> so uh, I'm still surfing and I'm, I don't feel I'm back to work. So I'm quite honored to be here and to be part of this, uh, this conference uh, with uh, so many prestigious uh, you know, speakers. Now, uh, Samuel said it was his first uh, you know, Canadian uh, Nutrition Society meeting. It, it is mine too. And I feel I'm the newbie here in this group. Uh, even though it kind of brought back some memory to me, I did my master degree with uh, Dr. Germain Brisson. Uh, probably none of you know him, but he was a nutritionist from uh, Laval University. And uh, my first conference in uh, you know, women nutrition was in 1976, where I presented my my uh, my work as a master student. So. Uh, and today I wonder why it took me so long to come back here because I really enjoyed this, uh, this meeting and the, the speakers and the presentation that uh, we've had uh, today. So uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll step into uh, my presentation. Uh, uh, what I, I, I prepared today is uh, how many people are Aggies here? I guess, you know, we, we're all in food, you know, we're feeding the world. But you know, in agriculture, I, I gathered you, there's not a, a, that many of you here. So I think it's, 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 it's appropriate that I speak about agriculture and agri-food Canada and the food industry in Canada uh, to start with. Then I will uh, present you some work that we did uh, of an action plan to uh, help support the industry uh, and the sector to uh, develop some uh, health claims. You know, the regulatory path is quite complicated, complex. So we had this action plan and we'll, I'll give you a few examples. Uh, with uh, real data from scientists, not me. Uh, I'm not uh, an expert, but, uh, and, and if I have some question, I think Dan is, he's here, you know, some of the data is from Dan Ram, that was here, so you can ask him the question. And finally, I'll, I'll speak about the path forward in this, in this area. So first, what is uh, the purpose of agriculture and agri-food Canada? It's, it's, it's part of an act, and uh, we are, we exist, uh, we have a mandate, uh, and it's to inform, uh, provide information, research and technology, policy and program and service to support the sector. Uh, so this sector uh, can compete both uh, nationally and internationally, uh, manage risk, embrace innovation. You know, that's how we, we grow uh, new, uh, new food products and uh, gener generate economic returns. So one has to understand that uh, of the many departments in, uh, in the Canadian government that uh, we have a very strong economic uh, mandate uh, and it, it, it guides a lot of our decision and, and action. So uh, as a branch, and I just want to go back to this mandate, you can almost see the organizational structure of this department. You know, uh, science and technology is the largest branch. We we'll provide research and technology. Uh, we have about 44%, almost 44% of the employees of agriculture and agri-food Canada. But we have a policy branch, strategic policy branch. We have a program branch, and we have also a market and industry service branch. And I'll speak of some of the collaboration that we had between branches and other departments uh, regarding health claims. So that being said, the science technology branch, uh, our role as a federal science provider is to inform, you know, through science, that's the knowledge, uh, regulatory and policy decision. As public servants, uh, we don't make these type of decision, but when there is knowledge, there's science needed, we're there to provide that information, that science, so uh, the best uh, policy and regulatory decision uh, can be uh, made. Uh, we also uh, have a lot of scientists and uh, uh, we're there to produce what we call far from adoption, uh, applied science with broad stakeholder application. So that's, that's more of the upstream, the, the more long-term, the more risky uh, type of, of, of research that needs to be done leading to innovation and support the sectors. And finally, we're there to support innovation uh, to improve the economic prosperity of the sector. And I, I would stress the word here, support. Uh, there are many ways to do that. We can be active with our science capacity and science technology branch, but we also have program, uh, such as the, uh, you know, the last two agricultural policy framework that we named Growing Forward, that uh, those are, the latest one is a billion dollar investment into the agricultural sector. Uh, 
uh, and a, a lot of it, almost $500 million, were dedicated to an Adagree Innovation Program. I'll speak a little bit about it. So anyway, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to the focal point of all our activity uh, are on Adagree-based uh, production system. Agri-based production system leading to you know products developed to food processing and finding their way to to the table of people uh, both in Canada and abroad, and the, we have some fundamental priority. Uh, that's what we want to ensure that uh, we enhance the economic uh, the sector's economical and physical resilience. Uh, we expand the commercial frontier, leading to new opportunity for sector growth, and we're there to enable enable a competitive sector able to respond to market demand. And, and prosper uh, economically. Uh, to achieve those goals and fulfilling our role, uh, we have developed sector strategy, and there are several of them, uh, going from uh, you know a, a commodity-based cereal and pulse, oil seed, uh, all the way down to an agri-food strategy. There are, on the basis, you know, there's a foundation for that, uh, biodiversity and bioresources, and also the agro-ecosystem productivity and health. Uh, so those are very specific sector strategy, commodity based for most of them that we've developed. And they all have the same cross-cutting strategic objective to improve. And those, those are, are standard, you know, they're the grand challenge that we're facing uh, to feed 9 billion people, but to increase agricultural productivity. In some cases, you know, I, I often look at the sector strategy for dairy, uh, it's efficiency, you know, they produce a lot of milk. We want to be more efficient. But in other cases, there is a gap between the genetic potential and what we observe, so we still need to increase productivity. Uh, we, we're there to enhance the environmental performance, and we all know about climate change. One that is quite interesting and, and appropriate for this group is we would like to improve attributes for food and also non-food use. But the attributes for food are very important. And I think some of these attributes can be functional, you know, from a processing point of view, but they could be health-related, such as health claims. So that's an important strategic objective that goes across from at the level of the farm, you know, having the, the right ingredient or the right composition to support some of those health claims and, and supporting also uh, the agri-food strategy. And finally, well, in agriculture, we face a lot of threats, so we have to address those threats to the sector. So to achieve that, um, <clears throat> We have a network, and I, 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 I apologize for not having the slide. I will include it, but we have a, and for those who are not from Canada and don't know our country uh, as well, uh, we have a network of, of research centers that goes from the British Columbia uh, to per province, you know, Alberta, uh, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and then you come to Quebec and Ontario, there are four research centers in each of the province, and, and then we have research centers, one of them in each of the maritime provinces. Now, regarding the food sector, uh, you have to understand that in Canada, most of the processing uh, is done in the east, in Quebec and Ontario. So we have two, uh, two uh, 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 research centers that are de dedicated to food research. One is Site Siasin, uh, a lot of focus on food processing, uh, with a very big industrial program, uh, pilot plants and, and so on. And I will, uh, for the benefit of all of you, uh, uh, we've created a video, uh, YouTube, uh, to explain these, uh, these, the, the activity in these two centers, and especially the industrial program. And in Guelph, we have a, uh, a pilot lab, level two pilot lab, where we can work uh, from a food safety point of view. So we have a network, and also we have programs, uh, agri-innovation programs uh, for pretty much all these uh, sector strategy. We've created the network uh, uh, clusters. So for example, there is a, uh, there is a dairy cluster, there's a pork cluster, there is a pulse cluster, there is a cereal cluster, there is a soybean cluster. So this is to uh, help uh, the, uh, develop uh, and innovate uh, uh, into, in, in the sector. And the reason why we also uh, had this program, we wanted to build capacity in the industry to innovate. But building that capacity while mobilizing the Canadian capacity, both in federal lab, but also in, in university. So uh, Growing Forward was the first program in Canada where grant and contribution and then money voted in Parliament to support uh, uh, federal scientists could converge to achieve common goals that are market-driven 
and established by the industry. So these were uh, strong programs, very f popular programs, and we're moving into uh, in 218 uh, going forward three. So our capacity uh, in Canada uh, through these clusters activity, uh, we were able to, uh, to support innovation in the sector and, and innovate. So uh, the food beverage sector in Canada is very important, as you know, or maybe you don't. Uh, it is the uh, Canada's largest manufacturing sector. So it's bigger than aviation, transportation. It, it is a very important. And, and as you know, AFC is an economic base uh, department. So we're supporting this, uh, this sector. It's also the largest manufacturing employer in, two, in 2013. It supplies 75% of the processed food to Canadian and of of which 17% uh, is also exported. And it's, all, it's very important from, uh, from a, a farmer's point of view because uh, the, uh, they purchase 34% of the agricultural production uh, in Canada to support the food processing sector. So uh, food processing is a critical link uh, in the farm to fork value chain that transform agricultural products uh, for consumers. And uh, this sector faced many challenges and opportunity. Some of the challenges are this persist persistent negative trade balance that we've been seeing uh, over the year in Canada, uh, starting in about 2005, 2007, and it keeps going down. Uh, and we would like to revert that. Uh, there's sometimes difficulty to meet the quality and cost requirement for customer in the export market. Canada is export oriented in, in many commodities. Uh, we have a large country, uh, very few people, and I think we can produce uh, to help uh, uh, feed uh, people, uh, the nine million people, billion people on this planet. Now, there's increasing demand by consumer for ulterior food products, so we see that very often. But there's also those insistent food recall that are costly, which impact also consumer confidence. Growing environmental pressure, and finally, uh, you have to understand that the food processing sector is, is, is between Quebec and Ontario is quite different. Large, large, you know, uh, uh, multinational uh, in, in, in Ontario, very, very large number of small and medium enterprise, business enterprise in, in Quebec. So the way, you know, especially the small, medium uh, business enterprise, the way they can support uh, uh, innovation is, is with limited funding is a challenge uh, for them. Now the opportunity, well obviously a significant portion of the economic value in the food supply chain is added beyond the farm gate, obviously. Uh, innovation in post-processing can help enhance the shelf life and nutritional quality of, uh, of Canadian food and expand you know, both domestic and, and international market. Uh, Canada is an aging population and diverse population, so the demand for variety and healthier food, and healthier is not necessarily uh, from a, uh, a nutrition point of view, from a safety point of view, but also you know, related to health claims to help maybe prevent or alleviate uh, some of these uh, food-related uh, uh, you know, um, issue uh, from a health point of view that are developing in, in people, not only in Canada, but worldwide. So uh, we need to develop uh, innovative food products, and there is uh, you know, uh, obviously uh, uh, a tremendous market opportunity for Canada in this area. So uh, healthier food, that's the topic of this workshop. And uh, it seems that this is not really a very new concept because you had this gentleman you know, who said one day, let food be thy medicine, and medicine be thy food. So uh, this is quite old, and I think we might have forgotten about this concept because I was wondering uh, a little while ago in a major Asian city, and I came across this mural where it stated that the food industry pays no attention to health, and the health industry pays no attention to food. So that was quite interesting, and but they had challenge, you know, uh, from a food industry to uh, to be able to. Uh, especially in Canada through the regulatory process and how do we get those health claims you know, into place. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the, uh, in 2008 and, and prior, a little bit prior to that, we developed this action plan. And uh, it had uh, three, the goal was to help the industry to understand the regulatory process and requirement in order to facilitate the market 
entry of new food products. Now there were three components. There was an industry engagement and knowledge transfer. That was led by the market industry and service branch that we have within AAFC. There was a science substantiation that was led by our science technology branch, and I will focus on this component. And then there was a regulatory enhancement, including fortification with Health Canada. So there you go, you have a partnership of, of different branches within the same department and two departments. And, and, and you'll see later on that, that kind of raised some question about mandate and mandate creep, but I'll explain that a little bit later. I'll focus on what we did in terms of, uh, of uh, science substantiation. Now, the, the logic model regarding science substantiation was quite simple. You, know, uh, you have a sector or an industry that desire uh, a health claim, and how do they get there? And one of two ways, uh, either the, you look at the totality of the science evidence, and you put that into a package, and you submit that to, uh, to, the, uh, to Health Canada, and, and they make a decision regarding on the health claims. And I'll, I'll, I'll speak first of an example that was done regarding this. The health claim was for barley beta gluten. And uh, Dr. Nancy Aim uh, from Manitoba was the lead on this uh, on this health claim. Uh, and she started in 2007, you know, uh, she formed a consortium uh, they, uh, between 2007 and 2002, they gathered the data and they look at the scientific evidence using uh, Health Canada uh, interim uh, uh, guidance document for preparing a submission for food and health claim. Obviously, you know, this interim data resulted eventually in, in something that is, uh, that is in place. Uh, she uh, conducted meta-analysis to uh, gather additional evidence. She even went on to analyze beta-gluten content from commercial barley samples and, and summarize the dose delivery, uh, delivered by typical barley food. And uh, she prepared health claims and she filed a petition in 2009. Now in 2012, Health Canada finally approved a, uh, a claim uh, for cholesterol lowering uh, effect of, of, of three grams based on the consumption of three gram barley beta-gluten per day. Uh, qualifying that must contain at least one gram of beta gluten per serving, and it's it's posted on the website. And you can see a typical claim on a, uh, a product here in Canada: barley fiber help lower cholesterol. Uh, this created some potential benefit for both the Canadian agri-food sectors and consumer. Well, they obviously, the uh, trigger increased demand uh, for Canadian-grown barley, open new market for value-added products and it provided the consumers with help promoting food choice. So there's an example where there was enough evidence and took five years, long process, help at the same time help Canada to refine the guidance document, but uh, this was achieved uh, to, uh, this was achieved through, uh, through uh, cooperation between the two departments and uh, several branches. Now, you don't always have all the evidence. It might not be adequate. So you, you need to identify what are the gaps, the scientific gaps, and you can target research to fill those gaps, which we call science substantiation. So uh, I will provide you a few examples where we achieved it or we are still on the way to achieving it. But uh, uh, the uh, initial objective of this science substantiation was to establish domestic international science, science partnership. Some of the evidence you'll see, it's, it's a clinical trial done in several countries and, 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 and so on. Uh, and to conduct those research where there's those gaps. Uh, there were several projects that were initially selected and I just list them here. Uh, you can read them. Uh, as, I, as I can. Uh, I'll, I'll speak to uh, a couple of them there. And then in 2011, uh, we uh, went on to establish four more priority area uh, to conduct these uh, type of activity to, uh, you know, uh, fill the gaps needed to, uh, to, to help claims. Now, uh, Susan Dutch was one that worked on old products and uh, the blood cholesterol lowering effect, uh, and she studied the efficacy, but also the role of viscosity. So in her work, uh, she prepared four different uh, old brand cereal with the same formulation, except that they were extruded to cause successive degradation of the uh, soluble fiber, the beta-gluten. So you have molecular weight that goes from 2 million to 200,000. Uh, the control was a wheat brand cereal, uh, equal dose of dietary fibers, and she used two different uh, beta-glucan dose. What she did, she conducted uh, a human uh, uh, feeding trial 
uh, in three, three countries, you know, Canada, Australia, and, and UK, five different centers, 367 participants. And you can see, you know, some of the results that uh, she obtained. Obviously, the wheat brand versus the old brand, uh, there was a, a definite effect on cholesterol or LDL cholesterol. So LDL was lowered by 5.5% uh, for high molecular weight cereal containing the three gram of beta gluten per day. Um, she demonstrated that, however, uh, this efficacy was decreased as, as the viscosity decreased. And uh, she demonstrated the mechanism of action is related to development of viscosity in the gut caused by beta gluten. So there's one where she, she, we went from barley to oat and, uh, uh, you know, uh, showed the evidence needed to, uh, to such claims. Now, uh, another example, and Dan is here, uh, actually the next two was from Dan's, uh, Dan's uh, office, um, um, lab in Guelph. Um, one of the uh, uh, effects that he was studying is the lowering uh, of cholesterol of old soil flowers. Uh, he wanted to determine the efficacy of this uh, old uh, soy, uh, soy flower, standardized at two different uh, levels of, of protein. Uh, and it is a collaboration between uh, three different institutions in Winnipeg, in Toronto, and in Guelph, involving about 243 participants. Now, um, the result might not have been what he was looking for, but uh, science, you know, we do things and we learn. So it did not really reduce LDL cholesterol or other risk factors, but it, it noticed that the processing in a muffin resulted in a loss of beta conglycinin relative to glycinin. And I think uh, is, 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 is suggesting that the in, it informed the industry partner and realized that the effect of baking soy flours on, on the bioefficacy was affected. So we, they needed to change the processing method or breed soy with heat resistant uh, beta conglycine. So uh, in this case, uh, did not really uh, you know, fill the gap uh, to, uh, to yield to a health claim, but learn something along the way. And, uh, and there might be some strategy being developed by the industrial partners to achieve uh, such health claims. Now, the other example that uh, uh, Dan uh, worked on, Dan Ram, that was to assist the pulse industry. You know, pulse is, is, is an important uh, growing business in Canada, especially in Western Canada. Uh, pulses are rich in protein, and uh, they have also uh, a uh, carbohydrate profile that is, uh, uh, you know, lead to a slower degradation and absorption of, of glucose hence impacting positively on glycemic index. So you wanted to look at the attenuation of blood glucose uh, using a whole lentil. So the result that he obtained was that about a cup of whole lentil re will reduce blood glucose by 75% compared to an equal amount of starch from white bread. He also observed a significant reduction when half of the starch from white rice was replaced by whole lentil. Uh, but you also notice that uh, processing of, of lentils will affect the uh, degradation of carbohydrate and might lose some of the beneficial effect in terms of slowing absorption. So there's more to be done. And there is a further study on the minimal effective dose of pulse in lowering blood glucose that is ongoing at the, at the moment. So these results were added to the file and, and the future result will be added to the file. Now I'd like to mention also, uh, it's more downstream, but I'm, I'm very privy of, of work done by Pulse Canada with, uh, with Chinese partner. And they really look at how they can take yellow pea flowers and incorporate that into making uh, rice or wheat noodle, uh, uh, biscuit, and a steam bun. And so far, they've I've even uh, did eat some of those biscuits the last time I was in China. But they've, they've been able to incorporate yellow pea flowers into making uh, uh, you know, noodles and also biscuit up to 25% and without the beanie flavor. So they found a way to kind of remove the beanie flavor. But in some cases, you know, they did a survey and, and some of the consumer in China like the beanie flavor. So it, it's just a matter of choice, I guess. So obviously uh, there's uh, some tremendous uh, potential in terms of the, for the pulse industry here uh, to, uh, to be able to incorporate the uh, high protein content pulses, but also slowly digestible carbohydrate and, and thereby uh, um, help attenuate some of the effect of uh, on 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 uh, the growing uh, issue of diabetes uh, worldwide. Finally, Krista Power also working on working on pulse and gut health. 
Uh, she, t she targets several type of crops. You know, she works obviously on you know bean variety, chickpeas, lentil, flaxseed, and also asparagus. And uh, she uses a uh, a mouse model, uh, where the diet is supplemented with all food. You know, and all food is at those achievable in using appropriate food preparation method for human. And she studied the effect on the gut environment, so the microbiome and the impact of such change on subsequent uh, human chronic disease, such as inflammatory bowel disease or obesity. Um, so far, you know, in, just in the pulse study, she clearly showed the beneficial effect on the, must, uh, on the gut uh, microenvironment induced by pulse food, which allowed an overall reduction in inflammatory associated disease, uh, such as the two that I mentioned before. And that will eventually contribute to uh, future health claims. Now, she's provided me some data, and, and obviously, you know, you can see here that uh, the, basic, the basal diet versus the bean, you know, in terms of a microbial community, uh, there is some obvious diversity that is being created. And also, you know, the production of uh, short chain fatty acid is affected by the type of diet. Finally, uh, she look at the uh, you know you look at the uh, enhanced effect on the integrity of the gut barrier. If you look at the goblet cell population is is is, is larger when, when fed bean versus the basal diet, and also the uh, profile of uh, of uh, cytokines in the gut is being affected. So this is quite interesting uh, in in terms of result and observation uh, that uh, she's uh, she's achieved uh, so far in her research. So, like any uh, good programs in the government, there is the, there are, there, we have those very smiley people, you know, like people from the Office of Audit and Evaluation. Very smiley people, very nice people, you know. They come and ask questions and then they make recommendations and you have to answer to them. Uh, the smiliest people are people coming from the Office of the Auditor General. And they're even smilier. <laughs> but you really have to pay attention to uh, the, you know, their audit and, and how you respond to their audit. So they did the, this uh, in 2013. They came and saw, see us, came to see us and uh, conducted uh, an audit. And, and I'll just focus on the audit they did on the science substantiation uh, component of the uh, Agricultural Regulatory Action Plan. So their recommendations were two, of, of two natures. Uh, they wanted us to review the research alignment of human clinical trial with AFC mandate, priority, and capacity. I think one of their concern was, uh, did we have the capacity to do clinical trial? But also, they were concerned about that we have that mandate. This is it the mandate of Health Canada? Uh, and, and in government, you're always concerned about mandate creep, you know, like a department starting doing the job of another department, they really don't like that. So we took that very seriously. The other one was our research project, uh, project selection process, which I will not touch here, but uh, they wanted to make sure that uh, we were addressing the, the right priority. So how did we respond to that? Uh, we did extensive legal review, three of them, and we consulted within AFC and also with AC, uh, with, with HAL Canada. And the conclusion was that uh, AFC, the AFC, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, has the legislative authority to engage in and fund human clinical trial where research is related to agriculture or product derived from agriculture. So we're not in the pill, the drug business, but if it's something that is coming out of agricultural products, uh, we can engage in clinical trial. But there were some recommendations related to that uh, that we had to adhere to. Uh, when you look at the uh, product pipeline, um, one of the things that, uh, you know, it goes from foundational to preclinical and then to this end stage, which is where the claims and the authority to claim it is, is given to you. Uh, AFC does research only on new health products sold and consumed as food. So, uh, example, the probiotic, but not on pills, capsule, etc. Uh, we can participate in clinical trial, but it is at the discretion of the minister. And uh, it's only through a collaborative or a research and development agreement, and I'll explain a little bit uh, more about that, with licensed medical or clinical capacity and expertise. So our scientists can continue 
to perform and publish foundational and preclinical research. So these steps here, we can be involved, and I showed you a few examples. But when it reached this level of clinical trial, uh, we can have one of our scientists being the PI, but the person conducting the clinical trial has to be a certified medical clinical investigator. And this is when the minister might say, yes, uh, you can uh, do uh, such work. Now, the, uh, the other aspect of collaboration that uh, we have uh, established, uh, not only with the, the CRADO, uh, we can be involved as scientists in the department, but we can also support uh, other organization, either university or the industry in the conduct of, of clinical trial. But that's to uh, the use of contribution agreement. Uh, so vote 10 is just a government jargon. It's, it's grant and contribution that we give to an industry or to university so they can uh, conduct the research, uh, in, in this case, the clinical trial that they wish uh, to conduct. Uh, mind you that uh, to protect the, the, uh, the crown from liability, we've inserted both in the CRADO and the con contribution agreement some clause, uh, one of them also being uh, the, 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 the fact that they have to uh, conduct a clinical trial using certified medical uh, clinical investigator. Now the last, uh, the last aspect where we could be involved, and I, I, I'll be frank with you, I don't see very much hope for that particular approach. The department would, uh, through procurement, would provide the, uh, would have a service agreement with a service provider to conduct a clinical trial. Um, we're not in the business of selling food uh, or food with health claims. Uh, we're there to support innovation, but uh, the, the latter uh, uh, tools to do such work uh, might not be uh, used uh, by, uh, by this department. But obviously the first two are there to, uh, to support innovation, to support the conduct of clinical trial leading to health claims. And that helping our, uh, our sector to be competitive and uh, commercializing uh, innovative food uh, that uh, uh, will help uh, the health of, of Canadians and people worldwide. So that being said, uh, this is what I had to present to you. I want to thank you very much for inviting me uh, to make this presentation. And uh, now that we were on the TULIP uh, uh, you know, discussion this morning, uh, I would invite you to go by Dow's Lake, uh, which is a little bit you know, south from here. And by the time you get there to Dow's Lake, you'll see the uh, wonderful tulips that are growing there. And if you keep going southeast, uh, you'll get to the third most visited uh, site in Ottawa, which is the Central Experimental Farm. So you'll walk, to, uh, you'll walk through the Arboretum, and then you'll get to a floral garden, and then you'll see the farm. So if you have time, uh, please do so. It's a very nice place to go in the spring, especially if you like trees and flowers and, 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 and plants being grown in the field. So thank you very much. I'll ask the uh, first question about uh, health, both the health claims activity. So is, is uh, AMC still continuing on supporting health claim development? Yes, uh, through the uh, what we call Growing Forward 2, uh, which runs between up until 218. We've had several clusters, uh, you know, filing requests to uh, to do such conduct, uh, conduct such uh, such studies, and so we've been providing what we call the grant and contribution money uh, to these uh, to these different organizations, different clusters, and uh, I cannot speak about the result because they are ongoing. Uh, but obviously, uh, just an example, the dairy industry is looking at uh, you know, how uh, dairy products can have an impact on cholesterol also, or on calcium absorption, or on, that one seems to be so obvious, but they're still interested in doing clinical research on that. Uh, also on diabetes, incidence of diabetes. So uh, yeah, several, several of them. Pulse Canada is uh, doing some work uh, in this area, and, and so on and so forth. So yes, we do provide uh, that type of funding. Yes. Thank you for the presentation, very interesting. Um, I am interested, I mean, you're quite open with the fact that part of the reason for doing this is for the industry feeling that it gives them a market advantage. And I know at least in the US, when health claims were originally proposed, it was to help consumers being able to identify products. 
I'm just wondering if you, um, you or Health Canada somewhere, has there been any study of how consumers understand the health claim and what kind of validity they place on the, the claim on the product? I'm very sorry, but uh, I'm not aware of, the, of this type of study. Uh, obviously, we do that for one of two reasons, you know, like to help consumers uh, eat products that are better suited for their health. But also, you know, uh, obviously, it's, uh, we're targeting commodities that are relevant to Canada for which we have uh, maybe a market advantage and would like to, you know, not only grow it in Canada, but processed food that would have these health claims and, and help compete, you know, both nationally and internationally. So, but Dan, do, do, do you have an example or do you know of the, yes, so, I'm very glad he's here. <laughs> Very much. I'm very glad I'm here as well. <laughs> um, so in our soy study, we asked participants um, if whether or whether they would consume a soy muffin more often if they knew there was a health claim associated with it. And so despite the fact that there were some side effects, um, the gooey uh, texture, they all the majority of the participants said that they would prefer consuming uh, soy. They would consume a soy-based muffin if they knew there was a health claim associated with it. We just published this in the Food Research International. Hmm. The, the only, uh, and this one, I don't have the data, it's, it's just people saying that to me, but uh, when I was in China, in China there was a, uh, you know, a food industry uh, partner with Pulse Canada that did to conduct a small you know, survey in, in the Tianjin area. And clearly, you know, people, you know, yes, you know, if food's gonna kill you, they're not gonna like it, but if food is gonna be healthier and help you alleviate some of the you know, health problems that you have, obviously they, would, they were responding uh, you know, to, to these type of products. So it seems to us maybe a no-brainer, but I'm not very much aware of very extensive studies where this has been done with con through consumer studies, but maybe other people do. Yeah, just my comment. Really interesting presentation. There is actually a project that's just finishing in Europe called Kimbo. See, they have some incredible acronyms for that. <laughs> C L Y M B O L, and it's actually a project that looks at the role of health related claims and symbols in consumer behavior. Huh. Specifically, looking at the impact of the health and nutrition claims regulations on consumer behavior in consumer in, in purchasing um, products that are have nutrition health claims on them. So they're actually, and I, I didn't realize this, but they're having their final conference in England June 15th, 2016, this year in person. So really interesting. But I can tell you, it does influence me. <laughs> <laughs> Other question? Yes? Um, well, very interesting data you showed. So the pulses, it's the year of the pulse. So yes. Uh, I was just uh, also reflecting on the link with Europe. Our EFSA is quite strict regarding health claims. At yeah. least that's what I understand from the, the regulators and, and also from the industry people. And uh, I'm involved sideways a little bit. My colleagues are involved in, in, this, uh, in judging these dossiers. It's quite a lot of you know big numbers of pages. Uh, do you ever correspond with them? Or are you, are you less strict or more strict? Or how is this relationship? Globally, so well, I can tell you that the, the, the big industries of yeah. are global. Yeah. Well, you know, through the action plan there, we work with Health Canada to develop their guidelines, you know, for health claims and, and try to establish a path for those who are interested in, in seeking such health claims, you know, uh, how to do it. Um, I would doubt very much that we're not as strict as other countries. Um, but I cannot, you know, I'm not from Health Canada, so I cannot really answer, but I would doubt very much. The dossier is quite large. Uh, I think uh, uh, Susan, uh, you know, Nancy Ames was 150 you know, pages document. So uh, it's quite elaborated. And obviously it's all based on science, you know, you need to provide the, the right science and the, so. based on what in the U.S. we would refer to as significant scientific agreement 
I think you call it generally acceptable at, at the high level, which makes no sense to me, but nonetheless, that's, I, I understand that's what you call it. So if you look at that cadre, usually you find pretty good consistency amongst um, regulatory agencies. Um, you know, the U.S. has had health claims for a longer time, so there are a couple that are based on older data that the agency has indicated it, it wants to revisit. The, the kind of twister that started to happen is in the U.S. we came up with this qualified health claim paradigm because of legal cases, so it's less than significant scientific agreement. And then I think also because EFSA looks at structure function claims that kind of opened a whole other window. So that's where you began to see the variability among these countries. But when you're really looking at that high level claim, I think generally you see pretty good consistency. Yeah. Other question? Yes, in the back somewhere. Uh, just a quick comment, William Yan, Health Canada. Okay. Um, <laughs> There's the guy. <laughs> yeah, so, um, just, Adam, what just Barbara just said, um, I think when you look at science, most of the regulations around the world are very consistent how we look at claims and the kind of evidence that's required. Now, obviously, there are differences in how we actually regulate and whether certain claims are mandatory, other ones are optional, so there, there are differences there. In fact, for the last few years now, we've been having regular engagement with EFSA, with our colleagues in Australia and New Zealand, specifically having regular meetings and calls on health claims and trying to be as harmonized as possible yeah. in how we look at evidence and how we regulate these claims. So there's a lot of work going on internationally. We all face a similar claims, so it only makes sense that we leverage the resources and work together rather than separately and create more confusion. Yeah. Thank you very much. Harmonization is the key word here. <laughs> well, thank you very much.